right. Welcome to Startup Grind. Why, thank you. Um, so tell us, uh, let's just start and talk about uh, Couchsurfing. Tell us how this started. When did this begin? Where did the idea come from? And, and uh, what problem were you originally trying to solve? Sure, absolutely. So Couchsurfing for me began way back in the day. I was actually traveling in Egypt. And um, I took a chance on some locals. I, you know, usually you're kind of afraid of hanging, you know, you don't know who you could hang out with, who, who's safe to hang out with. And I decided to take a chance on some locals and kind of go hang out with them. And I got to go and you know, smoke hookah with the granddads. And then eventually they uh, helped us, me and my friend, kind of climb around the pyramids, climb up them, go inside of them, all kinds of things. And I was like, so mind blown. Like, Normally, if I was just scared and I didn't trust a local, nothing would have happened. But I did, and I got lucky. Uh, so that was kind of the, the beginning. I said, wow, it would be so cool if I could travel like this all the time. And so I started getting, getting this idea going. That was like 97. Couchsurfing, Couchsurfing has over 10 million users. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk to us a little bit about how you got your first 100 users. How did you... Sure. Where did the first people come from? How did you get a, how did you get the first initial traction going? Well, I needed to create something that people would like, so I first started by doing an MVP. Right, I um, sent uh, 1,500 spam email messages to people in Iceland saying, "Can I stay on your couch?" And about 100 people said, "Sure, come on over and stay on my couch." Uh, and that was like, "All oh, right, cool. I guess people do want to hang out with strangers." Um, well, Iceland and Scandinavia in general is very, uh, tr a very trusting, uh, trusting country. But what I did, uh, what I tested was what would happen if I included a bunch of personal information in an email t to get somebody to trust me. That worked. So that was like the beginning, the, the vision. Um, but uh, then I had to program it. <laughs> That's a big, that was harder. So it took me years of just kind of trying not to go to the bar at night. Go, you know, I'm not going to hang out with my friends. I'm going to stay home in the snowstorm and keep programming. And living in Alaska and different places around the world, um, finally had an MVP programmed. And uh, I decided to launch it. When I first launched it, I said, or everyone kept telling me, what about the crazy people? You, you shouldn't allow just anybody to sign up. But in keeping it closed like that, nobody signed up. So I decided, OK, I want to open it up and opened it up in 2004. And the first thing I did to get 100 people to sign up is I went to a community I thought of that was kind of similar to Couchsurfing, Burning Man. <laughs> went to an early Burning Man forum and said, hey, burners, check it out. Like, if you're travelers, maybe you want to check this out. And that created the first, like, 100, 200, 500 people that were all very colorful, world explorers, interesting people. And that kind of set the stage for the initial feeling of what Couchsurfing was like. How, how is the mission different from today? And you're, you're not, uh, you know, there's another, there's a team that's running it now, but mm -hmm. just the mission today, how has it changed from, say, those early days when you started? How, is your, how has the vision for the company and the product and what's possible changed over, yeah. you know, almost 15 years? I don't think the vision is like changed that much. The, the vision is like, how do we help create inspiring experiences? How do we get people together and create a backstage pass to the world? You can learn about yourself, you can learn about the world, and you can do so for less money, and that helps you do it more. But that's all about the same the strategy for how we do that. That keeps changing. We keep trying different strategies over time to try to make it sustainable. What, what ingredients do you think made it unique or made it sticky or you know, feel different from any other thing that you know, somebody had put in a forum? Right, right. Well, I think, first of all, it's controversial. That's always a helpful boost. People remember things that are controversial. What? You're going to stay on a stranger's couch? Huh? Yeah. So it helped. Pe uh, media really would, like love to talk about it. Obviously, they did, never did, needed to do any um, marketing. Media would just show up. Hey, can we write another New York Times article? Would that be OK? OK, sure. <laughs> is, is all press good press, or is some press not good press? I don't know. There's deep, different thoughts on that, probably. <laughs> um, what, what does community mean to you? What it, I think, you know, when you, it's now the sort of yeah. buzzword, everyone has to have communities, maybe the new mm -hmm. customer, mm -hmm. but to you and seeing this organic thing, like what do you, when you think of community, what do you think yeah. of, what does it mean? I think of Maslow's hierarchy, and it's kind of what I think of. I think of basic needs. A community helps each other meet their basic needs. So it could be 
basic like, like shelter, sure, that's an important need. It could be um, love, human connection, appreciation, like just hanging out. Like it, when you travel with couch surfing, it's, you can kind of travel longer. You don't get that kind of ghost feeling where you take a couple pictures of some statues and you travel for a week and you're like, I kind of want to go home. But with couch surfing, you're interacting with people. They appreciate you. They're connected to you. They're providing safety to you, hopefully. And all of those things, so you can go, go longer. That's what community means to me. You, you started it as a nonprofit and eventually turned it into a for-profit business, raised mm -hmm. uh, more than $20 million on mm -hmm. the business yeah. uh, from some of the very best venture capitalists uh, in the world, uh, Benchmark am among them. Mm -hmm. um, yep. What was the thinking there when you started? And is that something that, you know, if you have entrepreneurs here that are thinking about starting a nonprofit, talk to us a little bit about what you learned sure. from that and, you know, how yep. things may have been different. There are so many lessons, and if we had more time, I'd go into many of them. But I say if I could just distill this down. Uh, so I started Caltrafing as a nonprofit because I thought, yeah, it seems like a community effort. That could be a good idea. Uh, so I'd started a for-profit previously. I thought, maybe, maybe try a nonprofit. It's very kind of whimsical. Um, but I had to learn some hard lessons later. Uh, at least in the U.S., uh, as a nonprofit, you're, you're constantly asking for permission to, for different activities, like, hey, we want to do this. Is this okay? Is this legal in the nonprofit system? We want to maybe sell this kind of thing, or you know, and, and so on. These activities, and so we tried to p apply to the IRS for five years and spent a half a million dollars trying to trying to get charitable status. And in the end, they were like, we don't. We think you look like just a way to save money, so you're not charitable in our mind, we, and we don't want you to be in the system. Uh, so that was interesting. But then also, what we learned, they said all these things you want to do, we have never told any other nonprofit that they could do those things. So therefore, you can't do them until you get a private letter ruling or a, you know, some kind of ruling from the IRS, and that could take a year or two. So we thought, okay, so we want to innovate. We're a startup. We want to do it in a good way, but anything charitable starts to not look like innovation or a startup. It's it just kind of at odds, just at, at a very low level. So we thought, okay, well, let's con try to convert then. They told us we had to. And so we said, okay, well, let's convert to a socially responsible B Corp. So that's the best um, vehicle that we could see. In, in the users, I mean, in terms of, I mean, it, there's, when you make a change yeah. like that, which is a pretty fundamental yeah. change, there's a lot of shrapnel that comes along with oh it. Oh, my God, uh, yeah. Basically at every level from. Infinite. <laughs> yeah, infinite. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so so is, is your th is entrepreneurs are thinking like, look, I want to do good. I want I want to make a positive change yeah. in the world. What is your recommendation? Be v I mean, be very careful. Don't fall into the trap I did by just kind of whimsically selecting some entity or location. I selected the location and entity type where I grew up. Bad bad mistake. Uh, I ended up paying for it sorely later. Uh, and like you said, shrapnel, all kinds of problems. Uh, so I would say. You know, really get find great advice. <laughs> really ask questions, and I'm sure you'll you'll do fine. But uh, you know, if you do want to do good in the world, and you think maybe it should be a startup, uh, and that it should also be a nonprofit, just be very careful about how you construct that, and be aware of the innovation question. If in the place you are, if you're a startup and you're a nonprofit, are you allowed to innovate? It's a good question. It sort of feels like when you when you form your company and you get started. It's almost, in many ways, you've, you've written the last page of the book, uh, or at least certain outcomes that it can be, and you've eliminated certain pages that it can't be, right? So it's sure. like, like, think about up front, if, if I understand what you're saying, like, think about up front what you want the end of that story to be, right. where you're ultimately going, and then yeah. make sure you, you set things up in that way. Absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, there's the super not kind of nonprofit path. There's kind of a, a middle hybrid path, which is like, we want to do good in the world. We want to be Impact. a for-profit. What? Impact company. Impact yeah. company. So you're going to, like you're talking about the last page, it's, it, does it require an exit? Are you basically signing up for an exit? Well, if you are, then you're way over here. But if you're signing up for something in the impact realm, what type of, if you have investors, impact investors, what kind of exit are they expecting? So you got to really you gotta think about these things. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, one thing that's really unique about you is, is you worked on this one idea for such a long time. <laughs> and the people we read about, the people that get on the magazine covers a lot of times are not working on ideas for a long time. They're working on them for a short time and having you know, tremendous amounts of success and then moving on to something else. Yeah. And entrepreneurs are, are just across the board uh, 
you know, constantly have new ideas and want to be, you mm -hmm. know, kind of can be scatterbrained. What, what kept you sort of focused on the same idea and driving the same thing for such a long period of time? Right. How did you, how did you overcome the random idea that you had you, you thought could be some huge business or, you know, or when someone brought a cool opportunity to you, you know, not getting involved in that? How did you mm. stay focused? Well, it was pretty easy. There were so many things happening with Couchsurfing all the time that demanded attention. Everything's on fire. That uh, thinking of anything else was just not really possible. So I mean, imagine you're, you know working ten years and it's it, it's growing, but there's all it's 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 a complex business or or uh, organization. But I think it's just pure complexity. But I would say that I lear I've learned so much from that experience. It's powerful lessons. Tell yeah. tell us about your new project, Massley. What is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Another project I'm super passionate about, it's called Massly. And what Massly is, is it's a way to m double or triple the outcome of, uh, output of your company. Um, as we know, companies are hard to build and nine out of 10 may fail in a couple years, but wouldn't it be great if people that are working on a project really got passionate about it and really felt like they were part of it, they, like, they were thinking like a founder. But it's hard to kind of get people thinking that way. It's, you know, do you have to use inspiring language? Or a lot of times what we think is use equity. So and what I noticed in, in Couchsurfing, I got to see an A-B test. I got to see, we're a nonprofit. We're paying people $24,000 a year to program. And people are getting some good things done. Things are going up and to the right. And then when we converted to a for-profit, we started paying people $100,000 a year to program. And then I thought it was going to be, okay, we're going to get more done. It's going to be better output. And then it wasn't. It wasn't exactly like that. I, so I started asking Was people, it less? It was Same? paying people more, but getting... Maybe less, maybe the same, maybe just different. Um, you know, some software got thrown away. Uh, just maybe people, people started, I started talking to people, and some people started to say, it's kind of like a job. Uh, just tell me what you want. I'm not going to think about whether this is the right thing for the company. I don't, you know, just pay me, whatever. So, uh, so I say, well, Silicon Valley, we have these stock options. Isn't that going to help you get inspired? And they were like, not really. Uh, I don't know what those are. Uh, I was like, well, you signed this th thing. Oh, well, it's this thick stack of documents. I don't know what it is. I don't know how it works. I don't know if I'll get something later. And maybe that I have to pay, I have to buy some options. I mean, I, I don't understand. This doesn't, it's not clearly, that I'm not clearly and clearly aligned. Maybe it's a nice to have someday. So I just could see suddenly clearly, I'm like, of course, like, this, who's going to sign a, a stack of documents that thick with no description of even what it is and get inspired? <laughs> so this is what Massley is about. It's, takes equity and gets rid of, it, it reduces the, you know, you have to read a bunch of docs and puts it all into a dashboard. So you can see your ownership in a startup or in a company in real time. And what we noticed when we trusted this out with several companies over the last few years is people get really excited. They start to think like a founder. They start to believe in their, their ownership. Why as is part. that? What was that? Why is that? Well, I think people get, uh, what I've seen people getting really excited is because they s it seems real suddenly. I, I, if I had to say if, if uh, a traditional company with no equity, you're getting like 1x output. I think with the stock option plan, you're getting like 1.3x. And I think with like a gamified or game dynamics where you can see your ownership, you can imagine where you're going, and you're recording your hours and you're getting more, o you're getting more ownership as time goes on uh, that's really fair. That's like a 2x or 3x output because people start to think, they start to focus and say, what should we be working on here? And then if I say, well, hey, we should do x, y, and z, and they don't believe that, they'll say, I don't think so. And I'll say thank you for, for thank you for saying so. Whereas in a, if it's just a job, they're not going to say it. They're going to say anything. So in a typical venture back startup or startup where you're sharing equity, you sit down, you say, "Here's my comp here's your compensation, mm -hmm. here's your equity, here's your benefits or whatever else yeah. you know the perks you get as part of the job." And with this approach, it's basically here's here's your benefits, mm -hmm. here's your compensation, and if you'd like you can, here's your, here's an equity opportunity. Mm -hmm. You can take less compensation if you'd like. Right. Uh, or you can take, you know, you can keep the compensation you have. And if you really, like, work really, really hard, that number's going to go up. Am I, am I describing That's right. that right? Yeah, so imagine there's a, a, a Rails developer, and you're the, co you're the founder, and you're negotiating with the Rails developer, and the Rails developer says, I'm $100 an hour. So great, yeah, that sounds about right. Seems like what that, that's what market is, okay. Uh, well, how much of that would you like in cash, and how much would you like in equity? And a lot of times what we've seen is people give kind of three offers. They'll say, okay, how about 
$30 an hour in equity and 70 in cash, and then 50-50, and then maybe the reverse at 30-70 or 70-30, whatever. And then you'll see, surprisingly, people will come back and say, well, I already have another source of income. I really believe in this company. I really want to get a bunch of equity at, at the ground floor. So they'll optimize higher in equity. Or somebody else says, I've really got to pay my student loans. I'm optimizing for cash. And those are all great. But uh, what, what you see is that st people start to think about uh, where, what, what is value. You know, they start to think like a founder. How do you create value? How do you make a, a valuation go up, maybe? Because that's a kind of a summation of value. Uh, how do you help this company do better? What what really matters? Can you talk a little bit about in the kind of mm -hmm. historical approach of equity um, outside of you know found, you know with the team basically? What happened w if you go through that model? If you take that that kind of model that I don't know what percentage of venture back companies use it probably like ninety nine percent or something or 90, I don't know ninety five percent. What eventually where does that load road lead to? In for the employees, if the yeah. company explodes in growth, talk through like yeah. what happens in that scenario, and then talk through what happens in the sure. scenario of using sure. I'll just your do approach. Really broad strokes here. Yeah. Uh, so with traditional model, usually you pick like stock options. Some companies do RSUs like Facebook and Google, uh, which are like restricted stock units. Um, so what what often happens is a company says, uh, you know, let's take take a startup of like 20, 30 employees uh, in San Francisco hey, um, we're hiring this new person, uh, their developer market rate for a developer like this is 0.3%, so we're gonna pro we offer you um, this many shares, and the company may or may not even tell that developer if it's 0.3%, because that might be kind of hidden information, so the developer doesn't even know what that's worth. But let's say it's a good company, and they actually share that information, so the developer knows, okay, you know, 30,000 shares, and that's about 0.3%, great. So now, they they sign uh, you know employment agreement and they sign their the stock plan uh, and then they now they have these shares and that they s they don't know what the doc really says it's too complicated and they can't really ask uh, it th to get um, understanding they can't ask the company because that's a fiduciary duty the conflict of interest company can't tell you what it means so you have to go hire a lawyer and lawyers three four five hundred dollars an hour and that takes a few hours so most people don't do that and they get the stocks and they put it in a closet, put it in a drawer, forget about it. They don't know where it went. They never see it again. It's just gone. Uh, and then um, hopefully, you know, one day things are looking better for the company and people start to care. Oh, well, maybe, maybe we're going to have an exit. We just heard, I heard a rumor that there's going to be an acquisition. So then they start to try to figure out what, it, what, what do those docs mean and, and so on. Uh, but be, until that happens, it's, it's kind of like just a nice to have. It doesn't really motivate people to you know, think about it in the shower in the morning, problems of the company. You know, what is the company, what do we need to do? So that's, that's kind of like the typical model. Um, now this model's a bit different. The Massey model is using performance equity or dynamic equity. It's using what Fortune 1000s have used for 20, 30 years. But to build a plan like this, you need to, um, it costs you $500,000 or a million dollars. So we're doing what Fortune 1000s have done, but in a one-size-fits-most approach. So the way this is different is you create a, a pool of equity. It could, be backed by, it could be backed by options. We like to use RSUs because they're easier for people to use. Uh, and then now people, when they're logging into the Massey system, they're recording time or vesting, they can see what their slice of that pie is in real time. So they've seen that often. Oh, this is real. Oh, this is what the valuation of the company is. Oh, this is my piece. My piece is changing, either growing or, or contracting based on how much I'm working, based on my hourly rate, a bunch of things. And uh, that starts to feel real. So you, you start to think, this could really go somewhere, and I want to make that number go up. What, what makes this number go up? Oh, valuation makes it go up. My contribution, you know, so on. So well, do you think it'll negatively affect the really earliest employees who, you know, are really taking a huge, you know, that make, cr create a huge risk, mm -hmm. either pre-funding or, you know, angel seed mm -hmm. funding, and then, mm -hmm. you know, as the company, you know, it, it, as you said, hopefully the company, you know, grows. Does it, it, does something like this sort of, does it, does it negatively affect those people right. that took the hu hugest yeah. amount of risks outside yeah. the founders? Sure. Uh, it's a super com you know, a complex question and a really awesome question, and I wish more people, when they were joining companies, would ask this question. Because normally what happens is, is uh, when you're joining a startup, startup says, yeah, sure, we'll give you some shares. But what really happens is 
that people that are early on that are taking the most risk in a company, they're actually kind of usually more generalists. They're, they're generalists. They're, they can do anything. I can go around. I can do work on this. I can work on that. Uh, but those generalists get let go. They're not the people later that investors might say or founders might say, oh, we need somebody more specific and yeah, or capable. You're, this person's going to run a division or something. They're not right. like that. Right. So in the beginning, you're just getting who are the, the generalists who can get in just do a bunch of, do a bunch of things. Right. But those generalists tend, tend to be let get, let, it, get let go. So hmm. the way stock plans are written, generally, is that when you leave a company, you have 90 days to buy the options. But usually by the time the, is, that's coming around where you have 90 days to buy the options, that's when the company's probably worth a few billion dollars and your options may cost you 10, 20, 50, $100,000 to buy these options. So people, of course, don't know if the company is going to succeed in five years. Is it going to succeed? Who knows? So why would I go buy these options when I don't know if it's going to succeed and I don't even have the money to buy them anyway? Hey, wait a second. I thought I, got, I, thought I had some equity. You know, it's kind of, kind of what? <laughs> right. It's kind of this moment of like, oh my god, I thought I worked so hard for this company. It's kind of sad. So that is the traditional model. Usually people don't get any equity that are at the beginning stages. The way that ours works is you do, you get a fair share. Um, it seems like uh, one of the big themes here with this is transparency, which mm. feels like is very much you know, going to be a very normal thing here in the next few years. I think so. You talk about what, what are your, some of your thoughts on transparency, whether it's in this or whether it's other aspects of a business. Yeah. Um, you know, what, where do you see transparency going and how should people talk about their company with their team and what's yeah. really happening and things? Yeah, so I think that we are headed to a world that is more transparent. And what I've seen in, in seeing Mousely and seeing other systems is more transparency is generally better. Uh, you don't, if, if people can see what, each, what other people are making, like hourly, then when it comes to negotiation, you don't need to play hardball. Like uh, somebody says, I'm a developer at like $100 an hour. You say, well, you know what? You would be the greatest, the highest paid person in the company. You'd be the close, closest to you. So other Rails devs are getting about 80. And they'd be like, oh, wait, uh, I want to be a team player. You know, uh, never mind. Uh, I'll, take the, I'll take the 80. It's fine. Uh, so you, you see that a lot, just instantly. So it makes negotiation a breeze. Um, but yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm no, sure. that's it. That's yeah. great. I think, I think what I'm, if I'm an entrepreneur sitting here listening to you mm -hmm. talk about this, it's, which is really fascinating because, uh, you know, Massley is a very new product and, mm -hmm. and some of these ideas I, I haven't even, you know, heard that much about and I'm starting to really think about, hey, well, mm -hmm. and I think as an entrepreneur, you need to decide, hey, what models are we going to follow? What is, where, is, where does our ship ultimately go? And mm -hmm. does this kind of model, whether it's transparency, right. whether it's with the options or whatever, yeah. does that help me get there faster and, True. and better? And does it take care of the people on the boat better? And mm -hmm. yeah. so. Yeah, all, all companies are different, you know? It's, each one's unique, and so you kind of have to make your, get, get advice and make decisions. So, you know, of course, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not providing advice. But uh, I think that it's important to consider these things. And also, on the transparency question, different cultures have different ex expectations around transparency. So it could be that in the US, people are more open to that idea, or maybe in Scandinavia, they're more open to that idea, but maybe not somewhere else. So the way we do it is we ha you can dial up and down your, your, your level of transparency that you like. You've raised a lot of money from venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. is, are they worth it? Depends, you know, it really depends. Um, I think so. Uh, generally, yeah. I think it can be worth it for sure. It depends on what the company and what you're trying to do. If what you're trying to do is capital intensive, yeah, it's worth it because if it's capital intensive, you need capital. Um, but if it's something you can bootstrap and there's not like a huge amount of competition, I'd say try that. You know, go for that. That could be, you could have more, um, you know, flexibility later. But the thing that, that's good about having some investment is it really makes you think hard about what the value you're creating. So, I mean, it's a mixed bag, but I think that it is overall net positive. What, what about investors versus advisors? What do you see the role of advisors different from investors? Sure. Um, well, investors are there to provide money uh, and sometimes advice, but I think you hear like 50% to 90% of the time it's mostly money. Uh, investors are busy, so it's hard for them to provide um, advice unless you really specifically ask to target them. And they love it if they can share advice. They would love that. They want to be that. But it's hard to just to, to be. Or sometimes um, they don't. Sometimes, sometimes they, they don't want to. They yeah. don't want any. They just want you to be successful and yep. not bother them. 
exactly. So there's, they may just say they want to be helpful because that's what you're saying you want because you're right. talking about smart money. And so they're like, yeah, of course, smart money, sure. But you know, when, I, when I think of advisors, I think of people that are really going to add value. So I think of two kinds of advisors out there. There's optical advisors, advisors that are like, hey, look at this advisor. They're basically saying yes to me. They're saying they agree with the thing I'm doing. Um, and they're not going to really provide a lot of advice, probably, on a day-to-day -day basis because they're very busy, but it's a vote of confidence. That's a very useful thing. Um, so it's important to think of, what, is this person an optical advisor, or are they, like, really need them to provide this advice on going? It's so key. Maybe nobody knows of them. Nobody's heard about them, but they've done what I'm trying to do. So it, how you... How you uh, you know, create their incentive package matter. So let's talk about that. What incentive packages would you give an advisor, whether it's somebody not doing a lot yeah. or somebody that's yeah. helping you every single month? So if it's, a, if it's an optical advisor, I call them, then I would do something between 0.1% and up to 1% maybe. It depends on how much value they're bringing. Uh, and, if it's, and, and so that's kind of like you, you want to provide ongoing, um, just say, hey, keep... keep looking after us, keep sending me links every time you hear about something, you know, they're kind of a little bit more passive, you know, not as super active, but they, they're there, they're helping, they're thinking, they're talking with people out there in the world, providing credibility. Uh, but if it's somebody you need to do a bunch of work, let's say it's an IP attorney, uh, and you want them to provide a lot of advice, and it's going to be like an hourly repeated thing, well, then you want to kind of turn it the, um, the relationship into something that's a bit more hourly. Hey, we'll give you $300 an hour in equity, for your advice. So if they don't provide advice, if they don't deliver, then they don't get anything. So there's two couple ways you can provide. Is it traditional vesting or is it an hourly kind of arrangement? Yeah, I, I've been in, I, it's been fascinating to me. I haven't taken a lot of investment from different people, but the times that I have, you know, I, I think sometimes I've been, and advisors too, the same similar thing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the advisor things that I always go on is say, look, if I can, if you become an advisor, I may send you up to one email a month, mm -hmm. and I just uh, expect a response in 24 business hours, mm -hmm. and that's that's it. That's all you need to do. Occasionally, I might ask for a meeting, but like just answer my emails and mm -hmm. help when you can, and maybe you don't hear from me for a long time too. But right. um, but kind of setting the clear guidelines of like this is the expectation, this is what you get, mm -hmm. and then or like you said, like hey, if you're going to be hourly or this or that, like mm -hmm. let's make it incentive based so that you stay engaged and. Right, yeah. I think a lot of times you, you'll have these advisors that'll jump on, but then they don't do anything, but it's hard to kind of cancel the advisor contract. You're like, well, it's three years, and it just keeps vesting, and I don't really know what to do with this person, and I don't think they're even providing optimal help. Well, in the beginning, make it so that the contract only lasts a year, uh, and then just say, we would love to keep working with you. Of course, we'll just re-up it every year we'll just, just to keep it fresh, so maybe we, you deserve some more equity. So um, that will, I think, that can save you a lot of... Uh, Kind of that's a equity, great idea, actually. Equity going nowhere. That's a really great yeah, idea. Yeah. Um, th things, th things seem to have worked out for you in different places. What, what do you attribute most to your success? What do you, you know, is there something in the universe, or is it, is it something in? Where did you grow up? I grew up in a small town, in, uh, Brownfield, Maine, town of the thousand something people. Something about Brownfield, or? Uh, well, I think that early on, I was I asked a question. I uh, studied classic philosophers, and I wondered, do I have any free will? Yeah, I wondered, is, do I have free will? I started thinking about that and wondering if I would stay in this small town forever. Uh, and then that's kind of part of how Couchsurfing started. I started thinking about you know, intensity, diversity, and frequency of experiences. That would be how I might kind of break out of my statistical probable path and started traveling t to random places. And I think that was really helped me grow. Uh, instead of believing that I have ultimate control over everything, I was like, I, w wouldn't it be safer to believe I don't? And then I have to look for where I might have control, uh, where I might be able to have a choice. I think that's a safer strategy to, um, to, to live. Yeah. And, and do you feel like you, I mean, how much of it do you have control of? That's a great question. I mean, sometimes I think that it's all kind of, if we're in a causal universe, that, um, you know, if everything's cause and effect, then maybe I don't have control of anything. Or maybe if I'm living in a simulation, I have control of everything. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, uh, but I think about this stuff a lot. <laughs> yeah. Do you th um, in, do you do you think we may live in a simulation? Is that? I think it's possible. Yeah. I mean, the the number of times where things have worked out 
or whenever you're like, we can't raise money, and then you set your intention, like, okay, and then, then suddenly it works out. Beyond what you think would be statistically probable, suddenly it starts to feel like, are we in a, a post-singularity simulation where somebody turned the serendipity knob to seven? Uh, you know, just enough so you, things work out magically and it feels really good, but not enough where you're like, oh, I know, I'm onto this. You know, it's just like, right, it's just kind of kind of at the edge there. That's like, what it feels like sometimes. Like total recall or something. It's something, like, yeah, I don't I know. I want to be an entrepreneur <laughs> and then <laughs> they're just like dialing it up for you somewhere. Yeah. But then just when I start to say stuff like that, I start to see evidence, of course, and I was like, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> so <laughs> it, I keep staying interested. That's a good reality, I think, whatever it is. Casey, thank you very much for being here. Thank Appreciate you. it.